please welcome to the stage conference co-chair Beatrice Thomas. Whenever I uh, get introduced to come to a podium, which hasn't happened as often as I would like in my life, uh, <laughs> I think big money, big money. Like game shows or The Price is Right, like that's that like, oh, the lights, Bob, Pat, is it Pat Sajak, Bob? I don't know. <laughs> um, hi, beautiful people. Uh, hi. Excellent. Um, I want to open up uh, this session by first inviting any indigenous folks in the room to either stand or put a hand up or in any way be made visible. I do this because I see you and you. That is that is uh, <laughs> what happens when you have multiple opportunities for indigenous folks to stand and be recognized. Sometimes there are other places handling their business, um, but we're still going to make that room. Uh, I like to do that because it's so important for us to have to fill our minds with contemporary visions of indigenous folks to get us out of myth and to get us into like current. Um, lived experiences. The Association of Performing Arts Professionals wants to pay respect to the many indigenous tribes of New York whose ancestors have been here in memorial for so long. We acknowledge that we are gathered on the island of Manhattan or Manhattan and are situated on land that is the homeland to a number of indigenous people. We pay respect to their elders past present and future. Elders and ancestors, I'd like to say. We pay respect to the Lenape people, the Manahattan, the Canarsi, the Shinnecock, the Rekongongwak, and the Munsi. All consider this their homeland. And more importantly, I just really want us to move forward and celebrate contemporary expressions of native arts and culture and look for ways that we can bring that into our contemporary lives. <laughs> Thanks. I did nothing, just, we're just elevating history. Um, welcome to Saturday morning plenary session. Um, it is so good to see you all. We especially want to welcome our new colleagues. Hey, y'all, how you doing? Anybody overwhelmed yet? Yeah. yeah. Just like let it wash over you. Um, my first year, my calendar was like tumbleweeds. And this year, someone, an agent was like, ah, because it's just like stack, 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 stack. Um, that was, I felt like I had gotten a badge of honor when I got that reaction. Um, we especially want to welcome the folks who have been coming to this conference for a very long time. And I want to ask you, if you see a new colleague, go ahead, you know, show them the ropes or tell them to go buy some Zycam or just, you know, whatever tips you have to share them. Um, what we're going to do here today is we're going to work uh, through, work together with APAP's Cohort 3 Leadership Fellows in their presentation of five provocations for the field. What to say about this fellows group? Mouthy, <laughs> pensive, bossy, introspective, opinionated, compassionate. What you will experience today will be the culminating event of two years of convening and questioning our field by people in our field individuals who are brought together because of two common beliefs. One, that this field needs some changing to meet the urgent cultural needs of a shifting regional, national, and international arts landscape. And two, that they were just the people to lead that change. Leaders, am I right? What <laughs> um, you won't see is the rigorous commitment to grappling with these challenges, engaging in hard conversations around inclusion, exclusion, and belonging. 
you won't see how we struggle to make room for each other's individual needs without slowing down the process. You won't hear us challenge the value of efficiency over humanity in process. You won't see how we held each other collectively accountable to our actions, be them good or bad. And you won't see how we were fundamentally rewired to discuss, dialogue, and collaborate in a different way. You won't see the uncomfortable smiles. <laughs> you won't see the big eye communications. The tears, nor the laughter. What I hope you will experience is a collective vision for the future, new ways to get there, and some piece of that that you can all co-sign on to. We look forward to being engaged and challenged by your voices and perspectives as we reimagine some fundamentals of the field and co-create our future. We also want to welcome our colleagues joining us through Facebook Live. There's a table right over there. Hey, Facebook Live table. Um, we're going to be dialoguing with our audiences virtually thanks to our friends at Culture Hub. We hope you'll not only watch and engage. I'm talking to you Facebook folks, but it's hard when it's just the board. Please engage, post, dialogue. Let's make this a global discussion. Uh, please use the hashtag, hashtag APAP5Provocations liberally throughout this session. Any little kernel or jewel. Or just if you want to you know, add some sass to the Twitter feed, let's just get that dialogue going. All voices are welcome. Either way, we will bring your contributions into this room and into what will be a decidedly interactive session. Let's take a moment now before we dive into our provocations to thank our sponsors. The sponsors of this morning's sessions are ICM. Hey, ICM, thank you. Thank you, ICM. I'm not even joking. I say thank you, ICM. <laughs> this morning, we're looking to break out of the convention and challenge expectations. In this plenary for the performing arts field, this session was created and will be presented by cohort three of APAP's ongoing leadership fellows program, of which I am a group leader. I, I knew someone to get this job. Ken Foster, Ken Foster, the maven of arts leadership, co-director of APAP's Leadership Fellows Program and director of arts leadership and professor of practice at USC's Thornton School of Music will moderate our session. Ken, how can you stand carrying all of those titles? It's just, it's like heavy burden. No, I'm kidding. Ken is amazing and wonderful. Uh, but first, please welcome Executive Artistic Director of Junebug Productions and APAP Leadership Fellows Program Group Leader, Stephanie McKee, to lead us in song. So in the spirit of this year's theme, the power of we, I think that is about moving from this narrative that we've created of us and them to a place of we. We is about collective action. We is about how we come together to create that collective action. So we will be embodying that practice by singing. So we got some eye rolls, some head rolls. We have all of that. But we, we will sing together. Now this is very easy. The song that I'm going to teach you is we are the ones we've been waiting for. Those are the words to the song, so that's easy. You think you got that? We are the ones we've been waiting for. This song was actually taught to me at Alternate Roots by Tafara Waller Muhammad, 
who learned it from Dr. Bernice Johnson Raymond. Now what is really beautiful about this song is that, as Dr. Reagan puts it, this is about power, about the power that we create together through singing. So something like a song like This Little Light of Mine, one might look at that on the outset as a song that is just about I. But the I is created by us singing together in that. And then that becomes the we. So now here we go. I'm going to give you your part, and you're going to continue singing that part on this side of the room. This side of the room, I'm going to give you a different part. And you're going to continue singing that until you see me do this. Is everybody good with that? When I do this, we will end. You got that? Okay, this is like bringing me back to my church days. Here we go. Here is your part. We are the ones, we are the ones we've been waiting. We are the ones, we are the ones we've been waiting. You sing it. We are the ones, we are the ones we've been waiting. Keep going. Here's your part. We are the ones we've been waiting for. 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 Keep singing. A little louder. Let me hear the joy in your voice. Keep going. The embodied practice of we. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you all for joining us this morning. I'm the arts leadership maven, Ken Foster. Thanks for that, Beatrice. <laughs> Amongst all those other titles. Uh, before we begin, I want to tell you a little bit more about the Leadership Fellows Program, although Beatrice described it in a way that I could hardly um, uh, compete with or compare to. Um, but just the, logistically, the way this works is that we set out an application process. We select 25 fellows who spend 18 months, 20 months working together. The first half of the program, uh, we really focus on your individual leadership and your organizational leadership. And out of that, each of the fellows is working on a particular project that's a learning project for them and for us. We come together then about midway through the program and we find out where everybody is and out of that we tease out what seem to be some major issues that are affecting our field. Things that we think we should be thinking about from a field-wide perspective. Because as Beatrice indicated, our idea with this program is not just to make you a better leader in your organization, but to change the leadership within the field, to really begin to address some of the critical questions that we're facing as, an, as a field that perhaps we get lost in our busy daily lives. Um, each of those, uh, of those 25 people, they're split into five groups and each group is led by a group leader. Um, and I wanna take a moment now to uh, honor and recognize the five group leaders for this particular cohort um, because they have been instrumental both in designing this session and seeing what, what happens here, but also in guiding the, the, selecting the applicants, guiding the program, working with their small groups to really create an effective experience for all of the fellows. So they're sitting in the middle of this group and so they're the only ones that aren't gonna get up except for right now. 
I'm gonna ask them to stand. So if you guys would stand, please. Keep, keep standing. You've already met Beatrice, let's keep standing. You've already met Beatrice and you've already met Stephanie, but the other three, Kathy Zimmerman, Andre Perry, Dan Fruit, they are true leaders in their field. Um, they are beloved by me and by all of us here. Thank you guys. Okay, so as I said, at the second half of this program, what we do is look at, at the projects they've been working on and try to tease out some ideas of what's, what's really happening that we need to be paying attention to um, in our field. And our idea with this session was to bring those to you in the form of provocations and to ensure that you have a chance to participate in wrestling with these, with these ideas the same way that we have. So we're not presenting solutions to the problems. We're not suggesting um, necessarily roads of action, although sometimes that comes out. But what we are saying is that these are, these are big issues that we need to think about as a field. And because we're inviting you to participate, for those of you that are, are uh, technologically challenged, on the table are, are pencils and papers. So I would encourage you, as you're listening to the presentations, to make notes of things that are striking you, things that you want to think about, things that like annoy you, make you angry, or make you say, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're finally saying this. Um, so, so that we have something when we, after we finish the, the presentations, we're going to have a chance for you to interact um, within your group, and then we'll have a little report out afterwards. So, um, before we uh, begin, uh, just two quick comments. First, there are five provocations. We, because we're linear people, we can only deal with one at a time, but you will quickly see that these are interrelated. And I think there's something, there's a larger issue for us to really think about there is that our desire to try to fix things one step at a time is sometimes frustrated by the fact that things are interrelated. And you'll see that interrelation in their presentations. Um, the other thing um, we're just gonna wanna talk about very briefly is that when we operate as a group, we develop uh, what we call shared agreements, sort of precepts that we're gonna agree to abide by as we, as we work through, um, as Beatrice noted, sometimes difficult, uncomfortable, challenging, emotional conversation. So we're gonna put those up on the slide now so that you can see what those are. And they, there's two slides here. I'm not gonna read them all to you because you can see them, but I do wanna point out a couple of them. Um, on this slide, I wanna point out to be present as fully as possible. I've been in your position, I've sat out there surreptitiously and not surreptitiously looking at my iPhone as I got bored with the session that's going on up here. So I'm gonna really ask you not to do that and to really bring your full selves to the conversation, both what's happening up here and what's gonna happen on your, on your, around your table. Um, speak your truth in ways that support other, respect other people's truths. Um, we are in a, a, a contentious era and we need to be able to speak our truth, but we also need to respect other people's truths. On the next slide, a couple things that I wanna point out to you is when the gut going gets tough, turn from reaction and judgment to wonder. We have our good friend and mentor, Liz Lehrman, to thank for this, who says when you get in the middle of those difficult conversations and you feel your blood pressure rising, instead of reacting, think, I wonder why I'm feeling this way. I wonder why she doesn't see my point of view. I wonder why I'm getting so emotional about this particular topic. We have many sessions during the fellowship program where we start talking and suddenly it, it, it hits you in a place that you didn't expect. Why, why, am I, why am I reacting that way? And I think there's some real lessons uh, to, be, to uh, be learned from that. And finally, trust and learn from each other. The power of we as a collective, this is where, we, this is where the wisdom lies and this is where the learning will happen, okay? So, um, pencils and papers to take note. Hashtag apap 5 provocations on Twitter if you wanna say anything at any time um, as we're going through this. Pay attention to the shared agreements and we're gonna start now with our first presentation from the group whose provocation is around leading from the middle.
Good morning. Uh, my name is Brett Elliott. I'm from the Catherine Hepburn Cultural Arts Center in Old Saybrook, Connecticut. Uh, when we first came around our topic, leadership from the middle, it was very clear that we were all coming from very different middles. The middle of organizational structure, the middle of the country, uh, mid-sized organizations, mid-career, uh, from the pivotal middle of the conservative liberal divide, from the middle between artists and community, and community organizers within institutions. At times it felt like we were talking in circles, trying to decide just what we were talking about. Uh, more importantly, how to synthesize all of our conversations and points into a cohesive, meaningful conversation. Good morning, I'm Leslie Hanlon, Director of Community Engagement at the College of St. Benedict at St. John's University in central Minnesota. Through our discussions and explorations, four themes continued to emerge. Number one, a willingness to step into leadership. When we're in the middle, it's easy to sometimes assume that leadership is somebody else's job. But if you're going to lead from the middle, it requires that we see the opportunities where we can make change and then have a willingness to take advantage of those opportunities. Number two, providing perspective. Leading from the middle involves identifying in and out groups and asking ourselves who really should be in these discussions and then building bridges. Number three, embracing alternative leadership models. Leading from the middle thrives in collaboration versus top-down power structures. Number four, we need to recognize that leadership can happen from anywhere, from all places. Leading from the middle challenges the hierarchical structures that many of our institutions were built on. The stories that you're about to hear reflect and expand on these themes. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, Brett. My name is Sam Livingston. I'm the Director of Operations for the Wild Music Institute at Carnegie Hall. Um, and I'm in the middle, the middle of middle management. I lead a team of eight in a department of 30 um, in an organization of nearly 200. I'm not the Executive Director. I'm not the Artistic Director. Um, my work is in operations for the Education and Social Impact Programs. And my story is just the beginning, uh, hopefully something that leads to bigger changes. Sometimes it can feel as though you're banging your head against a uh, shut door waiting for something to change. Uh, but for every door that's locked shut at the moment, there's one right next door um, waiting for you to walk through. In 2017, my department developed a set of core values that drive our programming, artistry, community, and equity. Our programming ranges from the National Youth Orchestras of the US to public-private partnerships, seeking to use the arts to reform the justice system to curricula used by orchestras across the globe. We were already doing a fairly good job of embodying these values in our programming, but when we put a mirror up to our own work together as a team in the office, um, it was clear we weren't living up to those ideals. So are there artistic solutions to administrative problems? Are we taking care of each other as a staff community? How can we achieve equity through opportunities for expression, leadership, and engagement for each member of the team? Sometimes it's hard to look in the mirror, and each of these questions raise deeper questions for us. Uh, but we have to start somewhere, and for me, that was um, remixing our monthly department staff meetings, a simple way that we work together as a team. Historically, these meetings were held in a large boardroom, 30 chairs on a long table. Various program managers gave their updates on what they were working on, and fewer than 10 of the 30 folks in the room spoke up regularly. I'm sure that we're not the only friends with that phenomenon. Uh, so we made a shift. Now we aim to empower more voices to plan and present in our staff meetings, especially newer staff. We require that any topic brought to the meetings be presented as an inquiry for discussion rather than simply a status update. And anyone in the department can propose a topic. We hold the meetings in our rehearsal spaces, artistic spaces instead of a meeting space. And we open each meeting with a reflective or creative moment. <coughs> this has created a new normal for our staff meetings. And when individuals from other departments stop by, they usually a look of, this is different. And in a way, this was a simple change, simply booking a different room, walking up a few flights of stairs, um, and setting up the chairs in a circle. But the small change can open a door to something bigger, and wherever we sit in our communities and in our organizations, we all see things we'd like to change and ways we'd like to adapt. Given my role at this organization at this time, this was a relatively easy shift, and I challenge you to identify the immediate changes you could make in your work and what doors those might open for you and your organization. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. 
hi, I'm Mary Jennings. I'm the Director of Programming and Development for the Rose Center for the Performing Arts, and I'm here with you today from Michigan's wild and remote Upper Peninsula. Uh, yeah! <laughs> for those of you unfamiliar with the UP, we are a giant landmass that sits on top of the lower Michigan uh, mitten. We make up about 30% of Michigan's total land area, but we're home to only about 3% of Michigan's total population. So my story today is about leadership from the middle of nowhere. <laughs> the UP Arts and Culture Alliance was established in 2017 by a group of artists and arts professionals, including myself, to develop the creative economy in the UP. We knew that lots of people and organizations were doing significant work in the region, but the UP communities are notoriously isolated, both from downstate Michigan and from each other. So the Alliance set out to build connections. Throughout the past year, the Alliance has been facilitating town hall style conversations to better understand what arts activities are currently happening in the UP and to determine what resources may be needed to grow or to sustain the region, uh, the arts happenings region wide. The first round of these conversations were conducted in five counties considered to be among the most under-resourced in the state. Invitations to participate in these conversations were extended to known artists, crafters, and patrons in each county, and a public call was also put out inviting anyone else interested to attend. In Baraga County, participants were asked about who is making art and who are considered to be the arts leaders in the community. What became clear from this conversation was that the community itself needed a better understanding of its own art scene. At this particular meeting, all of the participants were visual artists, and when asked about who is an arts leader, only other visual artists were named. Uh, who was notably disregarded were the organizers of an annual summer music festival, uh, and for whatever reason, the, the festival folks weren't considered professional artists despite the fact that this festival is wildly successful. It brings in dozens of ensembles and over a thousand patrons to Barriga County every summer. So before the Alliance facilitated this conversation in Barriga, we were led to believe that Barriga was one of the most art-starved communities in the whole region. Uh, but the, in fact, a significant portion of the art sector was being excluded. Uh, which led us to consider two things. One, we had to look at how we can extend invitations to future Alliance conversations so that attendees are more representative of the breadth of work happening in that county. And second, perhaps more, important, more importantly, it made us think about who is being considered part of the arts in-group in each county and who might be being left out. Working across 15 isolated counties in a rural region is slow work. With co five conversations complete, we will take the next two years to continue to facilitate conversations throughout the rest of the UP. Our work to foster regional collaboration can't be prescriptive. We have to listen to the people doing the work where the work is happening, which takes time. But the fruits of these slow labors will yield valuable information that will then be used to better connect and promote the amazing individuals and organizations producing, creating, and presenting work in the middle of nowhere. Good morning, good afternoon, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shannon Judson. I'm one of two Associate Artistic Directors for Urban Bushwoman. And as Ken said, we entered this process uh, with a proposal. For me, that became less and less important as I became increasingly curious about how is this fellowship program actually working? Year one, I was doing this like fish out of water dance and I had to understand what am I responding to? So I began to interrogate myself and also the fellowship program and really seething through what are the values at play here? What are the methods of operation? Who in fact are the leaders, the followers, the learners, and how do we know? It became clear to me that I was in the middle. And on one side, I had the organizational processes that I'm seeped in that were radically different than the one that was at hand. So I restructured, and I started to draw from those organizational practices that hold true for me, that of social justice community organizing and collaborative art making. And I use that to shift the lens in the conversations inside of my fellowship conversations. So if we were discussing how to implement diversity and inclusive po uh, policies, I offer how do we craft cultures and work cultures that are inherently inclusive? 
if we're talking about sustainability and how to sit more sustainably inside of our work environments, I offer that we explore methods of operation that are accountable to the humans in the workplace. And what if we source the solutions from our workplace from the workplace? Inviting, giving the opportunity, and also charging responsibility to employees to bring their genius to the workplace to elevate the whole. Navigating the middle with this lens on restructuring has felt a whole lot better. I kind of feel like I might even be in the middle a little bit more. But more than that and more than me, I feel like it's something that begs for a continuum. And so I offer that we change makers also look to source these other method methodologies of organizational culture and build with practitioners that are seeped in methods of organi organization that don't reflect the capitalist structures that stifle the very change that we want for our field and want for ourselves. <laughs> shifting the lens, shifting the values, shifting, shifting the systems that we elevate, the people that we employ, and shifting what we yield and the culture that we create. Thank you all for that. Um, hi, my name is Steven Manuzak, and I work on international programs at Arts Midwest in Minneapolis. As our group started discussing community engagement, my daughter was entering her own community engagement program. It's called Kindergarten. <laughs> she was bringing home artwork constantly, and one day she brought home a series of drawings, these drawings. I realized that in her class, my daughter was being asked to define community. And it struck me how the idea of community is not something we're born with, it's a learned concept. As a field, we often throw around terms like community and engagement, for example, when it's required for grant applications or funder reports. But who really is the community and how are we engaging them? Our discussions in this LFP program continue to, to challenge me to be very intentional when using these words. And now our group would like to share three different kinds of stories that represent some of the ways that we are questioning, redefining, and reimagining community engagement. Hi, I'm Michael with China Institute in America. Yeah, those are me, both of them. <laughs> <laughs> with the intention of representing my community, I was going to do a little bit of baking opera. I wrote a short story and I got myself a coach a reputable bacon opera artist who has performed, produced, promoted bacon opera in New York City for decades. Not only had I admired her dedication, I had also respected her new ways to bring new lives to this ancient art form. But ultimately, I was only excited to meet with someone from my community, someone who I can bounce off my ideas with. On a rainy Saturday afternoon, I visited her, this Chinese artist, in her house in Manhattan. We analyzed the script, we talked about me reciting or singing in different types of characters. She even called someone to help correct my presentation. That whole afternoon was an incredible working session. However, instead of doing that, we decided to share with you today an unexpected lesson from that afternoon. Next, I explained uh, the concept for this presentation. I told her about APAM and this fellowship program. I shared how we try to be advocates for racial, social equity, diversity, inclusivity uh, through art. That seemed to upset her. Suddenly she asked me, are those people Jewish? <laughs> While I struggled to decipher that question, she, she continued to express her frustration. Why can't we just treat art as art, she said. Why can't we simply focus on making art more perfect? I listened and watched her body language get educated, edu agitated and her neck turned red. It's really annoying to see them control the media and all those messages. Why do they always have to do that? There was a split second of silence. How should I respond? Am I prepared for this moment? How would you respond? I mustered up all the positivity I had in me and moved forward with the conversation. But I have questions that still linger. How do we continue to engage with people from our community while we learn how different some of our fundamental views actually are? Why do we continue to engage? 
what if we didn't? Hi, I'm Tamia Kanbubi with Junebug Productions in New Orleans, Louisiana. Junebug recently moved into an art space campus that was once a middle school called Andrew J. Bell Junior High. We were gearing up for another installment of the Homecoming Project, a community-based storytelling performance series informed by issues brought up by New Orleanians. These performances often end up being about and addressing issues of physical and cultural displacement, especially of black New Orleanians post-Katrina. This installment would take place at the Art Space campus and lift up the historical and cultural significance of the former Bell School and serve as an opportunity to gather with the community, our neighbors, former Bell students, and New Orleanians in general. The day the Art Space residents received their invitations, I received multiple very angry emails and voicemails from one of the residents threatening to protest and shut us down. He was furious that all of our artists were black and that we dared have a homecoming at his home. He demanded to know who the hell we thought we were. I took the time to respond, explaining that Junebug is also an art space resident, that our artists are very intentionally all black because, you know, white supremacy and institutionalized racism and that we'd hoped he would join us, but that we also understand that not everybody wants to be in community with us. When I told the artists that create and perform in the Homecoming Project about this, their responses were a reinforced dedication to the work. This work was, after all, a direct response to just this kind of thing. Black folks being pushed out of their neighborhoods by folks who move in and believe the neighborhood belongs to them. The night of our outdoor performance was better than I could have imagined. Our community came out in full force, from our elders to the very young. People brought their lawn chairs, picnic blankets, Popeyes, wine, their loved ones. After a br brilliant performance, we ended the night dancing and eating together, and I was reminded that this moment and moments like them are where we focus our work deepening our relationships with the people who want to be in community with us and letting go of those who don't. But how do we make the distinction between those hard relationships to keep and those to let go? And how do we find peace with letting go? Hi, I'm Teresa Remick, and I'm with the Page Theater at St. Mary's University in Winona, Minnesota. In 2017, we conducted months of audience research, and we learned that for many in Winona, their favorite events weren't the ones that featured award-winning or internationally acclaimed artists, but those where they were able to come support friends and family, like student performances and community theater productions. We wondered as a presenting organization how we could fulfill our mission of connecting our community to world-class performing artists, but still represent our community in that programming. This season, we chose productions that cast local performers alongside professional artists. We designed season-long initiatives in addition to one-off community programs, and we even elevated a local artist onto our professional series. But something wasn't clicking. After record sales last year, we found ourselves struggling to per solicit participation, even at some free events. We recently presented a company whose work connected to dementia, which is an extremely important issue to Winona. Despite several community partnerships, curriculum connections at the university, and a lot of marketing, it was one of our lowest selling performances in recent history. I found myself questioning if we were really on the right path at all. But one community member chose to dive in, attending four activities in two days. And in the end, a glimmer of hope came when he told me this experience was life-changing. It was exactly the outcome that we strive for and why we do what we do. So how do we effectively measure and convey this kind of success when we're beholden to parent institutions and funding sources that rely overwhelmingly on the numbers? 
What if an audience of hundreds has a surface level exchange with an artist, while an individual or a small group has an interactive experience that is truly transformative? How can we encourage a system where quality and depth of engagement are valued as highly as numbers of people served and dollars earned? A system where organizational values are truly aligned with those of our communities and with the values of those who hold the purse strings. Hi, everybody. I'm Bonnie Schock with the Sheldon Theater of Performing Arts in beautiful Red Wing, Minnesota. What these stories illustrate is that community is learned, evolving, relative, and interpreted. There are constant choices as we live in, work with, and engage in each and every unique situation. Structural systems of power cannot be separated from community engagement. When we do this work authentically, hard encounters happen. And real engagement is about going there, getting our hands dirty, wondering what we could have done better, being in the real moments that emerge and committing to struggling with them however messy they may be. Questions, possibilities, invitations, trying and failing, it's a lot like making art. And as we've tried to reimagine community engagement, we've been inspired to question industry expectations, systemic hierarchies, and ingrained processes which result in formulas, shortcuts, and mass production impulses which are ultimately anathema to an authentically engaged, community-based creative experience. So while a one-size-fits-one, individually crafted, deeply relational way of working is labor-intensive and not always guaranteed to generate the results we first envisioned, it is a key to shaping truly impactful projects. So this is how we invite all of us to redefine community engagement. One little question, one little mess, one little encounter, one little unknown at a time, with eyes and minds and hearts wide open. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Ronnie Pinoy, associate producer at Octopus Theatricals, and I'm based in Washington, DC. Our group reconsidered the relationship between equity and capitalism, yes, capitalism, as it relates to the world of the performing arts. So when we say equity, what we mean is that we are thinking about a comprehensive system of equality for all people in our society. So we realized quickly that we would not be able to provide any answers. We can simply ask more questions, to push ourselves to consider all of the ways in which these two philosophical stances, the equitable and the capitalistic, might intersect with or diverge from one another. What follows are our observations, reflections, and questions. If we can offer any insight, it's just this. Know that there is a community of arts workers out here who are game to ask the questions and face the challenges with you. Hello, my name is Sarah Rodriguez. I'm the Director of Foundation and Government Giving at the Apollo Theater. The American government was established by the people who it served and serves. Older, wealthy, white, Christian men. Systems created in this country mimic the government structure, education, business, religion, housing, language, and social behavior. It would be naive to think that this would not impact the arts world. The cultural inequity that pervades the performing arts manifests in all elements of the business. Artists, leaders, organizations, and audiences are all subject to inherent racism, sexism, and classism of the structures of our forefathers. Hi, everyone. My name is Dexter Story. I'm from a small town called Los Angeles. <laughs> Hence my coat on now. Uh, I'm, I, I'm an event producer at a, uh, an organization called Community Coalition. 
So let's consider an American performing arts institution, Harlem, Harlem's Apollo Theater. Named in 1934, it was initially a for-profit theater venue and not a home for African American culture. Due to its location in an area populated by a great migration in the early 20th century and an emerging market for entertainment, African Americans were allowed to perform on the stage in shows known as color reviews, but not allowed to sit in the audience. In 1935, however, Ralph Cooper's new talent showcase at the theater allowed American, African Americans to sit in the upper mezzanine to watch amateur night. It was then that the Apollo's white owners realized that African Americans would buy tickets to shows and revitalize the Harlem business community. Is basically anything that promotes growth and net revenue fair game in the capitalist market? And does this example represent capitalism as a motivator for the new black art at the, at the theater? Hi, everybody. How are we doing? <laughs> Same. A lot of ideas, right? Uh, my name is Lindsay Boswick. I'm the senior producer at the Arts Center at NYU in Abu Dhabi. One of the things that we talked about also was how organizational growth responds to more than just market forces. Our missions are what guide us, and our mission alignment and vision is or aims to be at the very heart of the performing arts. The mission has to be shared by everyone in the organization because it drives not only the work that we present and produce, but also our relationship with money and the community that we serve. When's the last time that you checked your mission statement? Does it still represent the community that you serve and the vision that you have? Is it a tagline for the last grant that you applied for? We can't change our funding models without understanding the impact it has on our mission and our community. If your ticket prices shift from $20 a ticket to $50 a ticket, who's left behind? And what are the creative ways that we can combat that as a field and as a community? Arts, community, and capitalism, can these three peacefully coexist? Should they? So in my work as a producer, I see capitalism in the way that we obfuscate tr financial transactions, specifically in how we talk about salaries and fees for artists and administrators. I believe that if the culture shifted and people felt more comfortable sharing that information, it would be easier to lobby for higher pay and make sure that women and people of color are paid equitably. Transparency, oh, thank you. <laughs> Transparency helps all parties understand where resources are going, full stop. So I'll, I'll give a specific example. Why was someone like Candace Feldman at the University of Arizona paid less than the standard that had been set by her predecessors? Does capitalism require us to cut all possible costs at, regardless of the consequences, or was it intentional? What I know is that a lack of transparency makes those motivation, masks those motivations so that we can't know. I'm back. There is a distinct funding gap for underrepresented organizations. The funding system established is a patriarchal one created without input from people of color, which has led to culturally specific organizations organizations, excuse me, being further marginalized. A recent trend in funding is to support diversity in programming and audiences, and yet the organizations that have been doing the work of working with underrepresented artists and underserved audiences do not get rewarded or acknowledged for its history of service. <laughs> funding is generally given to mainstream majority art forms and genres and practices that fall outside of these are not funded. Consider, for example, gospel music, tap dance, spoken word, and the countless others. Hi, I'm Emily Marks. I'm the founder and director of Lionheart Live Arts and Youth Theater in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, for years, I have gone to family programming workshops, conferences, and summits, and I've heard the same thing, that the work of American artists, especially LGBTQ, artists of color, and women theater makers 
It's just not there. It's not up to par. It won't sell. I hear so often, how can we program them or put them in our showcase if they don't apply? Yet, no one acknowledges it costs money to apply. I hear, how will I know these artists if they don't show up to showcase or conferences? No one acknowledges that it costs $500 for registration, $150 a night for a hotel, plus $400 for airfare, and a whole week away from your day job. This results, I see a system of heavily subsidized European companies led by white men fill artist rosters of TYA agencies. Um, they pack the programs of these showcases and then they end up in seasons across the country. This, I'm told, is the standard of excellence that I must fit into as an artist. I'm told this is the standard of excellence of what I must program my season. Um, the kids in my community deserve to see themselves reflected on stage. <laughs> the artists whose work I am passionately excited about deserve to get an opportunity to be in the marketplace as well. Um, just to step back for a second, we are all here in this room at the APAP conference because we have enough capital to be part of this conversation. How do we respect those who are not represented here in this room at this conference. So I was born into the bottom 99% of our country. <laughs> yet, yet I have experienced privilege like the top 1%. I live on both sides of the fence. I lament the exploitation and appropriation of art made by underrepresented, marginalized, and indigenous people for the good of capitalism, yet I enjoy and profit off the same availability of diverse culture for a living. At times, I see it all working. Other times, I don't see it working at all. I live in this tension of our times. I'm torn between the deliciousness of this American life I consume with pleasure on one hand, and the direness of inequality and commodity-driven neoliberalism run amok on the other. How do we become agents for transformation of our arts field, one of compassion, equality, and empowerment, even in the face of our basic need to feed the capitalist machine? How do we powerfully live and work in the inextricable tension of equity, equity and capitalism? Hello, my name is Andre Bouchard. I am the founder and principal of Walrus Arts Management and Consulting, also known as the Indigenous Agency. I have a story to tell you about decolonization. Uh, the story is about a native artist raised with some knowledge and of his culture, but his day-to-day -day life is in the context of the colonists, Europeans that came to our land. He's only, uh, he grows up with his parents and perhaps a couple other folk who understandably conflicted about their own heritage, being his only real examples of his culture. You see, the U.S. government has had for over 200 years what can only be described as a genocidal mindset towards Native people. So it hasn't always been uh, advantageous to stand up and be counted. As a result, popular culture images portray Native people, past and present, have become the most important examples of his cultural self-identity. Funny thing is, though, that these images are neither accurate nor positive. Native American characters are played by non-Native actors, and more often than not are the enemy, or drunk, or criminal. So this is what he has to grow up on. But he does grow up. Fortunately, many of our young people walk on to the next world from suicide or murder or substance abuse. In fact, he goes into the performing arts. And lacking a cultural role model, he assimilates for the most part. He learns from the ca canon of the Western colonists. 
But as he starts to work, he feels his ancestors talk to him. He starts the process of cultural rediscovery. And this process leads him to something that looks on stage neither like that of his teachers in the Western canon, the European canon, nor like what most people think of in terms of native art. So he tries to do his performing artwork professionally. But well, venue managers really don't know what to make of this. They, they dismiss it, or maybe they see it for what it is, but it doesn't fit with their marketing plan. And maybe they feel as though they should be doing something about it, but this is really way too complicated for them to be dealing with right now. So the next generation comes through the same system. No examples of people looking like them on stage. Nothing changes. I invite you to rethink what you believe you know about other people's cultures. Gamchul. My name is Hina Patel. I'm a South Asian cultural consultant. I came into the performing arts not knowing what it was about. I had a desire to see the stories, the arts, the culture of my community on stages in places where it could be celebrated and experienced by all. I came to APAP accidentally because of a Google search. I entered the room and my desi gaze scanned all the spaces. Did I see others who looked like me? There were far, far too few. And that still really hasn't changed 10 years later. I walked three floors of the expo hall counting the South Asian artists. My two hands were more than enough. In fact, I didn't even get to my second. I quickly learned that the culturally specific artists that were succeeding in the field were all being championed by white people. So here I was, a woman, a South Asian, representing South Asian artists. Did I belong? I created my sense of belonging when I created my company, Mela Arts Connect. When I changed my title from being an agent and saying I was a cultural resource and a cultural connector. I moved out of the silo of the title so that people would start to see me for everything that I had to offer could see my lived experiences of being in this community, for being a child of immigrants, for growing up with a hyphenated identity. But I had to do that for myself. Too, far too many others have not been able to do that. I invite you to reimagine the Eurocentric framework of our field so that we can disrupt it to make sure that other voices can truly be heard and invited so we can make this field truly representative of the diversity that is this country and this world. We just have a round of applause for how phenomenal this is. This is like. Uh, hi. My name is uh, Ben Cohen. I work as Vice President of Booking and Tour Development for Cadenza Artists in Los Angeles. Uh, I think that Hina brings up a very interesting point with respect to the stigma that we apply to people in different roles, uh, whether it be as an agent, a presenter, an artist, or any other position that we may occupy in this field. Uh, I'd like to address the paradigm of agent-presenter communication, which I see as troubled and problematic, particularly in the age of email and rapidly advancing technology. Uh, the system is problematic when, for example, agents spam presenters with little regard for their presenting mission and with little regard for whether or not their work is actually benefiting the communities that they're trying to visit. The system is problematic when an agent says to one of my presenting colleagues, uh, you know, when I pitch you something and you say no, that's when my work begins, as if the presenter can't be trusted to know their own community and what they're trying to put in their own venue. 
The system is also problematic when a well-meaning artist or agent sends a presenter a thorough, well-researched, market-specific proposal, and it's ignored because it's lost in the pile. And I think the system is problematic when I talk to people who receive more emails in a given day than they could possibly hope to answer. How do we get to a place where we can have honest and open conversations based on artistic merit and intentional exploration rather than responding to name brands or sticking to what has always been done? How do we get to a place where a conference exhibit hall such as this one can reflect the joy of discovery, artistic fulfillment, and personal education rather than a place to be guarded, defensive, and if you don't turn your name tag around at the right moment, accosted and grabbed at? <laughs> How do we get to a place where a no is accepted as a no and not an invitation to be convinced that you're wrong? And how do we connect back to the reasons we got into this business in the first place uh, and see our colleagues across the aisle as a way to bring that vision to life rather than seeing them as obstacles standing in the way of that vision? I would like to invite you to consider a new system of how we communicate with and collaborate with each other so we can continue to bring significant and meaningful art into the world. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jack McLarnon. I'm a curator and presenter at Seattle Theatre Group. Uh, it's a great honor to be on this stage with these esteemed colleagues and, and dear friends. Uh, how do we as a field reimagine what is possible on our stages when everything is so siloed? The world of entertainment versus fine arts, performing arts centers versus commercial promoters, not to mention the needs of different mediums, dance, popular music, theater, circus, contemporary performance, they all exist in practically different worlds, different timelines, different budgets, uh, almost speaking different languages from each other. Sometimes the very systems that we rely upon to create shows, get them on tour, and get them on stage can, be some, can become so restrictive that cross-genre collaboration can feel nearly impossible. When we fail to reimagine these policies and procedures, we inadvertently perpetuate the status quo, systems of exclusion that ultimately limit access and collaboration. So I invite you all to reimagine these systems and procedures to foster greater collaboration and build community. Thank you, Jack, and to my beautiful teammates. My name is Liza Green, and what these stories all bring up for me is the need for us as a field to find spaces for empathy and humanity to enter into our systems. I work as the associate director at NC State Live. I have the opportunity to create community collaboration, to build conversation, and I'm so fortunate to be in a position that allows me the power to make change. But seven months ago, my life was completely disrupted Yes, there's that buzzword again. <laughs> By the birth of my second child. While I was healing from an unwanted C-section, trying to nurture my spirited three-year-old, suffering from postpartum depression, facing what seemed like an insurmountable challenge to feed my young son, I was so preoccupied by how and when I was going back to work. My maternity, leave, my maternity leave, like most in this country, was so short. I looked to the field to find other models, but there aren't really any. We need, we need models to take care of new parents, to take care of people, to take care of people who are facing issues with their families. And I invite you to reimagine policies and procedures that put humanity at the center. So our story isn't an individual story, but rather a collective story. And a story that is woven with not only the stories of the people that you see here, but also for so many of our colleagues across the country. During our time together, and even before that, we have just heard way too many stories of instances of racism, 
of sexism, of hatred, of homophobia, of harassment. These stories have shook us to the core and has had us asking, how do we bring our best selves, our full selves, our whole selves to the work that we do on the inside of community? We're all navigating that place of trying to stay connected to our humanity and hoping to find the humanity in others. I am Miro Magloire, uh, Artistic Director of New Chamber Ballet. When I see these struggles, I see clearly what's good and what's bad. I see clearly who is among the good and who is among the bad. Until, as time goes by, good and bad start switching places until I notice that I feel oppressed by the oppressed, until I notice that I oppress the oppressors. It's easy to see what we are fighting against, but what is the world that we're hoping for? For me, the most important tool for that is an imaginary magic wand and I'm gonna share it with you today. <laughs> Close your eyes. Close your eyes. <laughs> Imagine that with your own magic wand, you have just solved all of the struggles that you are up against, all of the injustices. What does this world look like? When you get up in the morning, what do you see? When you leave the house, what do you smell? When you arrive at your workplace, what do you hear? Who do you encounter? Hello, my name is Leah Keith. I'm uh, an agent with Columbia Artists um, and also a producer of uh, new work. Um, in these past six months with uh, our small work, we've been, our small group, we've been focused on, um, you know, work-life integration, but really this uh, came forth with looking at our whole self and our whole community. And, you know, work-life balance, that's something that we're all constantly striving for, and oftentimes the pendulum goes from one extreme to the other. Um, and it's very challenging to, to find that, and there is no prescri prescriptive way for each of us to do so. Um, in this past year, I myself have come across, um, have had t many opportunities that have come to the table for me um, that are, you know, in the form of serving on boards, uh, network, you know, opportunities that will expand my personal network that have the opportunity to uh, push my career forward. However, um, this, those opportunities usually cut into my uh, family time rather than into my work time. So that's where that balance becomes challenging and um, a lot of these opportunities have come to me because, hopefully because of what I have to offer, <laughs> but, but also because I am um, a woman of color in a field that, uh, a part of the field that doesn't, that there are very few of us. Um, even that term, woman of color, I've had a hard time embracing. Um, I'm a light-skinned Latina, so I do present white, and so I often have this imposter syndrome. My name is Leah Keith. You don't know by my name, you know, where I'm from, um, but it is a big part of my identity, and so these opportunities come to me because we need that representation. They come to me also because I, I am a mother in the field and um, because of that balance and really having to hone in, well, which of these opportunities really line up with my personal values, with my you know, career goals and which ones can I really take? I have um, had to 
embrace the power of setting boundaries, saying no, even though I desperately want to say yes to everything, um, and being open to the fact that these opportunities will come down the line as long as I keep myself open to them. So I encourage all of you to, no organization is going to do that for you. You have to do it for yourself. And by setting those boundaries for yourself, um, you, give e you give others within your organization or um, within the field permission to set those boundaries for, the, for themselves. And hopefully then um, we can all really see each other as you know, human beings who aren't just agents, presenters, artists. You know, we are whole beings and we need to embrace our whole selves in order to become a whole community. Good afternoon. My name is Joshua Kane. I'm a self-represented artist in this business, which means my home life and my work life cohabitate. It's a difficult balance, and balance is not a state. Balance is a constant struggle to hold a point and discover a point. And with that idea in mind of home and workplace, sharing a dwelling, I've had to develop a philosophy over the past couple of years in this program of maintaining my brain. And I want you to imagine above your workplace, as I imagine above mine each day when I enter my home office, a giant billboard 20 feet tall with huge purple neon letters declaiming, nothing without joy. Imagine what that would feel like to approach your workplace knowing that you had a covenant with the people you were working with, that every interaction, every goal, every direction of that day would be done in the pursuit of mutual joy. How that would change how we approach our work. It is a struggle to find the time to breathe in our day, the time to acknowledge each other, to see each other, to actually be in the moment. In our home life, to make our home family survive, we had to create time to breathe and a right to laugh policy. RTL time, my 12-year-old declares every evening. 15 to 20 minutes where we gather as a family for a short game, watch a cartoon, read a book together, listen to some audio, but where we are present together, laughing, breathing, being together. I almost left the business during this two years as I struggled because the struggle to find that balance. So I decided to bring the right to laugh policy into my work when I went out. And I added an anti-toxic clause to my contract called the board game clause, <laughs> the no asshole clause. <laughs> Weeds people out really quick. Clause 33, presenter agrees to provide a minimum of three entertaining people to play board games with artists post-show. <laughs> <coughs> People thought I was kidding. I'm too old to sit in a hotel room in jockey shorts eating Taco Bell watching cable. I need the human connection afterwards the same way the audience needs to be lifted up by the art. Everybody signed off on it. All of my presenting partners, we gathered post-show and we stagehands audience members, board members, and presenters, and we played Cards Against Humanity, we played Dungeons and Dragons, we laughed, we ordered in pizza, and it changed the experience. And I went home more whole and left the space I had been in a better space. So in running our minds and our imaginations, I ask you to put in productive questions. The questions we ask will be the questions that we answer. I had the flu before the conference, and I made the mistaken question of how will I survive APAP? My 12-year-old reminded me, a better question, Dad, is how am I going to be effective at APAP? How am I going to make new relationships? How am I going to find better questions? How am I going to genuinely connect with people? So I ask you, as you go through this conference, ask yourselves questions that take you forward, deeper into community, and do commit, for at least today, to do nothing without joy. Okay, uh, I'm going to invite Bonnie Schock up now, who's going to lead us into the next section. We're running a little bit short of time, so um, you're going to have about 10 minutes at your table, but Bonnie's going to explain that.
Hi again. So now that you've heard all of this, we're going to ask you to expand on some of the themes and provocations that you've just heard. The instructions are pretty simple. Um, all you need to do is uh, respond to one of the five questions or, or more um, that you've just heard us all wrestling with and that we continue to wrestle with. So as a reminder, I think we've got them up here on the board. There are what does it mean to lead from the middle? How can we redefine community engagement? How can we in the arts live in the tension between equity and capitalism? How can disrupting organizational structures help us reimagine how we work? And what does work-life integration look like? So you can do this by making a statement using one of these jumping off points, just as something for you to get it going. So this resonates with me because. This provokes me because. This makes me think, dot, dot, dot. So you and your table mates can respond to as many of these questions as you'd like, and then you can let the conversation just take you where it goes. Um, for those of you who are here in the ballroom, um, please you know, have that dialogue with your whole table. Uh, for everybody who might be joining us viewing on Facebook Live, uh, we encourage you to add to the conversation by posting your responses with the hashtag, hashtag APAP5Provocations. Uh, so before we begin the conversations, I do want to briefly remind you of a few of our group agreements that Ken introduced us to at the beginning. So be present as fully as possible, try to be courageous, speak your truth in ways that respect others' truths, and use the opportunity to really trust and learn from one another. We've got just about 10 minutes. Um, our cohort is circulating in case you have questions. And at the end of the table talk, we're going to super briefly have an opportunity to share back out from uh, what you've all brought into it. So thank you all for being part of this with us. Why you, yeah, yeah, I know. So, Maybe take one or two, but the anything just what got reaction? Anything? I mean, I think the, the work life balance challenge is is a real struggle, and it's <laughs> it's a constant one. I don't think there are any quick and easy solutions to that. Um, yeah, I mean, like one one thing that I've started doing is, um, or that I've stopped doing, is I stop obsessively checking my email at all times of day. But I do make sure that anyone who might really need to find me has my cell phone number and knows how to find me, right? So I'm not putting that energy out there to always say, like, does anyone need me? Does anyone need me? Does anyone need me? But I make sure that if someone needs me, they can find me. So. Others? I run a ticketing company, it's about 30 employees, and we had our first um, woman who had a baby who actually stayed working, because a lot of times they have the babies and they quit, or we have guys who have become fathers, so I thought we had, you know, we're small enough that we're not forced to have even the six-week unpaid time, that is all the government requires of companies of 50 or larger. Um, and so we talked with her ahead of time, and she was progressing, even got a promotion right around the time. She was very worried about it um, and having the baby and, and how that was going to feel coming back to work. And this was her second child, but anyway. So we thought we had it worked out where we were giving her like an additional two weeks, and then she saved up her PTO, and we kind of milked all that out. And I, she dropped by the office with the baby, um, and she was to be coming back. I think that following Monday, and I just looked at her and I was like, "You, this, no, you're not ready. Like, this is not going to work. You could see she was still all bonded and, you know, in that mom zone. And so I just said, look, I grabbed HR and I said, let's sit down with her and, and you define what would work for you so that you feel like this would really work. We're, what harm is my company possibly going to have? by her, somebody covering her work for another few weeks. So we did a transitional back where she was, she came in half time for a while. We told her she could bring the baby anytime she wanted to. Um, and it just was a redefining. And so when the young gal got up there and she's actually doing a session at an upcoming industry conference to talk about, we don't talk about this. 
this is why women aren't progressing in a lot of these fields because they're making that choice and they're scared to death and men become fathers yes but they don't have that hormonal thing that they're going through for probably six eight weeks at least where you just feel like nothing matters but your baby because that's survival and that's what you're supposed to feel and so that's just an interest i was glad to hear her bring that up and we have to just be bold and make those kind of decisions and there absolutely no harm came from my company by giving her and, and we paid her all the way through and she still had her christmas time off she didn't have to give that up you know so it goes back to, I mean, we're talking about a couple of different provocations right now because that's also about how can we disrupt organizational structures to help us reimagine how we work, right? I mean, we need to look at what the workforce is, what, what are people's realities now in 2019, and what do people need to be able to be, to be, able to be successful and productive and, and continue to feel valuable and, and to be able to contribute because it doesn't benefit an organization to lose an employee. I mean, in my organization, when we have a vacant position, it's vacant for at least six months, and then there's a three-month search, and it's it's a burden. And yeah, so I mean, it's really in everyone's benefit to to work with people and to find ways to accommodate different and new challenges or old challenges. I want to elevate something that you said in sort of passing in the story that she showed up. And you saw that she, there was a need, right? And that so often we place the burden on the people to speak up for themselves and don't recognize that there is conditioning and processes and procedures that feel that make them feel like they cannot, right? And so that it is up to each of us also to take care of each other, right? Getting back into this conversation with my old my old pals here, which we had a few years ago in depth. Um, one of the things that um, struck me is, um, you know, these conversations about disruption, and also taking on the kind of the mantle of leadership. Just to generate these conversations requires a certain um, s status or kind of. Um, cushion of support I mean if you have a if you have an organization that has the wherewithal to, to make up for an employee that all of a sudden won't be working there um, and you, you know that's a big enough organization that can absorb that it's one thing if you're in a, a small you know a small uh, arts organization where there just is not the um, you know the excess capacity to absorb when um, you know some things things happen um, it's a different reality, and I think also for the artists themselves who are, you know, working with, you know, barely making enough money to survive, it's, they're not, they're not entering in these conversations in the way that we are as kind of leaders of organizations. They're, they're like, you know, they're, they want to get out there and do their thing um, and survive, basically, you know, come up with enough money for rent. They're not, they're not in, in engaging in these deeper level conversations about disruption, um, and so I think that's something that comes up for me is like, how do we take this conversation from a group like this that's assembled and then, um, you know, empower people that may not have access to coming to APAP or to work for an organization that even supports this kind of conversation? Um, I just wanted to add to that point. Um, and I was trying to put that into our Facebook Live here, you know, where you're like, how do we deal with maternity leave or policies in, in, in that way? And I think that there is a place of just having a conversation in terms of if you have a large organization, maybe you can just send them up to, to HR. But I still think in smaller organizations, you can have the conversation and you can ask staff or board everyone to get how can we address this? We don't have the, the funds to give you a luxurious uh, maternity leave. Can we talk about the reality of your situation, the fact that we don't want to lose you as an employee or staff or what have you? How can we, how can we do this and source solutions this from the people that, more than I can that are being you. impacted? I think it at least makes it so the folks who are being impacted can feel good about like yeah. a good about what the solution is well, ladies and, and gentlemen 
right? Because that's really important. And and I think I am, one of the I am, this pains me more than I can tell you to be having to stand up here and say an that just losing an employee has a huge impact um, on an organization. We have to make a slight change in plans. Whether that person is like, you know, um, being for like for a variety of reasons, all of the microphones and stuff need to go away now. Oh no. Um, so um, so this is not going to be possible, and we have a little closeout that we want Stephanie um, and Chanan to do for us. But I'm so um, energized by the conversations at your table. I invite you to remain at your table and continue your conversations. I also invite you to attend the plenary session tomorrow, which is a town hall in which some of the issues that we brought up here can be raised and can be discussed in a larger forum. So even though we were going to try to do that today, we just don't have enough time to do it. But I'm really um, excited by the energy that you've all brought around the table and happy to see that nobody's left yet. <laughs> so that's always a good sign when the audience doesn't leave. Um, so before, just as a way of kind of wrapping up, closing out this particular part, I want to invite Stephanie and Shannon up here to do a presentation. And again, I invite you to stay after and continue your conversations if you so desire, and also to bring your ideas to the town hall plenary tomorrow. Um, and also extend a personal thanks and a real big round of applause for Cohort 3. So this is an invitation. This is an invitation for us to go back to the beginning where we started, looking at and examining what the power of me means. Power of we. What does that mean? As I said before, we are the ones we've been waiting for. That means the genius, the solutions, are in this room. So as a show of your commitment to this collective action, this collective action that's gonna move out from the tables, out from our conversations, out of our heads, out of this room, out on the streets, across the nation. This collective action that we are all agreeing to in our various communities. So I invite you to take your hand and to create this gesture of holding the power that we created inside this room, this energy that's happened here in this room, how the conversations have energized us, have challenged us, and how we wanna take that energy back home into our home communities to take action. And this symbol is not about just the I, it is about what I agree to do in my community, what you agree to do in your community, what you agree to do in your community, what we are agreeing to do inside of our community. That, that is the power of collective action. That my friends, is the power of we. I just want to say, yes, honey, yes. Um, this was a good room, OK? This was a good room. There were some good conversations had here. I'm ready to talk, so if you see me running, it's okay to tap me on the shoulder, get me out my phone, and like, let's, let's have some dialogue. This is what it's all about for me. Thank you all for this provocative discussion. I like supplanting disruptor for provocateur. I think you are all now, like we have co-conspirated you into the role of provocateur. All right, please take these thoughts that were stirred up Talk to some people and bring yourselves to the town hall session tomorrow so we can get deeper into these discussions as a community. 
join this afternoon's professional development sessions and get your uh, insoles into your shoes because the expo hall is opening up at 2 p.m. today. So eat your Wheaties, drink your water, and walk that floor. Thank you so much.